Jimmy Dore recently had an interview with George Galloway. And the first question that George Galloway asked him about is policing. So we have another policing discussion here. I want you to hear what Jimmy Dore had to say in reference to the Tyree Nichols incident and policing in this country in general. So let's go ahead and get into that. Host of the legendary Jimmy Dore show. Jimmy, let's start with a very somber matter uh, indeed. The whole world has now seen the horrific uh, um, body cam footage uh, of the savage clubbing to death of Tyree Nichols in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, the police uh, not just killing him, but leaving him there to die slowly. The uh, other uh, services that turned up after the fact, standing around, laughing, joking, smoking, and so on. It's possibly the worst movie out of America that wasn't made uh, by uh, Martin Scorsese. Yeah, it's, you know, policing, I don't know how it is in the rest of the world, but certainly in America, it's broken, and it's been broken for a long time, and they fill our, our policing with ex-military people, too, which is another bad thing. And um, uh, there's lots of ways to reform the police in the United States, but the oligarchy doesn't want it. So let's remember what the police are there. They're not really there to keep you safe. They're there to protect the property of the oligarchies. And I want to pause there because I just want to add this comment here. What do we say on here? How many times do we say police solve 2% of crimes? I actually think it's 0.02%, 2% of crimes. That's it. And we've seen this over and over again where the police have failed. If you want to look at a more recent example in reference to protecting a school of children, for example, Uvalde, Texas, where the police were there for an hour, they were too afraid to do their job, too afraid to do their job. So when I advocate for things like defunding the police, it's because the data shows you, it shows you that they don't really protect you. The Supreme Court also has stated, and I'll see if I can pull this up, has also stated that it's actually not the police job to protect you. Now, I've mentioned this before on the show and a lot of people were shocked. That's coming from the, the Supreme Court. So I'm gonna see if I can find that and we'll get into that in just a second. And um, so, they, even though these policemen were all African American, uh, they're still saying that this was, you know, because of systemic racism. It's now been uh, reported that this interview was probably done before that, but it's now been reported that it was also uh, a white police officer. He was the one that was tasing him. Just wanted to add that for reference, there, guys. Inside the policing in America, I just think of, I think police in America are just. Uh, they recruit the wrong people. They're out of control maniacs. They're hopped up on steroids. Uh, they don't live in the neighborhoods that they police in. So they don't they don't see the citizenry in America as someone that they're supposed to serve. They see them as, they see them as the enemy. They don't live in the community. And I saw this too. Like you guys know my family is originally from Baltimore. They don't live there. The police officers that would come into my grandmother's neighborhood did not even live in that part of Baltimore. They didn't live in the city. They lived a lot of times in Baltimore County. And so they would come in from the county to police the city, to police neighborhoods that they're not a part of, to police people that they've never met. They would be hostile towards people that we all knew in the community had mental health issues, but the police officers, because they're not a part of the community, they didn't realize that. So they would be hostile towards those individuals. How do you expect that person to react if you're hostile towards them and they're dealing with mental health issues? They were hostile towards people who were homeless. They were host they were hostile towards black the black boys like in the neighborhood. So it's just this idea that you have police officers policing a community that they know nothing about, policing people that they don't know. This is one of the things that I think should change. Now, that being said, how many police officers are going to be willing to go live in, in the inner city in Baltimore? How many of them are going to be willing to leave their house in Baltimore County to go live in the inner city? They're not going to. Let's go on. 
And so, like, for instance, in Los Angeles, all, all the cops live uh, 30 miles outside of the city, and then they drive into the city to police us like they're, like not, uh, like they're animals. So that's what happens. And uh, there's really, uh, so we did a whole year of protests in the United States. Uh, it was the biggest protest in the history of our country. And what the Democrats did after that year of protest was they invented another police um department and they funded it with two billion dollars and then they yep. uh they gave many many more millions of dollars to the police it was the exact opposite of what their voters wanted them to do the demand from the george protest the george floyd protest was to defund the police so he's right it was the exact opposite the exact opposite and both parties do it the democratic party funds the police they give them more money the republican party gives the police more money so when it comes to an issue like the police state there really isn't that much of a difference when you talk about the two parties they're both pro police now the democratic party may call for some type of police reform but not enough that's actually going to change the system body cams really hasn't changed the system it's just made it more easy for us to see these events happening in real time. So again, we live in an oligarchy. That's why there will be no police reform because the police serve the oligarchs. It's the same problem with everything. It's why we don't have health care in America, the richest country in the world. It's why the richest country in the world, half of the people here are poor, or low income. It's 80% of workers live paycheck to paycheck in the richest country in the world because people don't realize that the United States, see people in America think the United States is just regular corrupt. They don't understand that it's 100% corrupt, which is why we yep. can send $100 billion to Nazis in Ukraine right in our faces when we won't send $100 billion to the United States so that we can fix homelessness or give people health care or a living way. And the people see that this is happening now, slowly starting to see whether they will get uh, uh, joined together and rise up. They need a leader to bring people together. And what's starting to happen in America is people on the left and the right are starting to see that they share a common interest. And that's what actually scares the old oligarchy the most and so if that happens then maybe we can have some reform of the police if that happens maybe we can have health care in america if that yep. happens maybe we can end these murderous wars for fossil fuels and hege and hegemony and maybe we can start investing in our own country we don't have you know we were supposed to get high-speed trains here during the first economic collapse in 2008 they were supposed to have high-speed trains all over america they never built one they still haven't even fixed the public transportation systems that we already have. We still have trains, at least here in Boston, we still have trains breaking down. We still have trains that are supposed to run in certain neighborhoods that don't run in those neighborhoods. The trains don't want run 24 hours a day. And it's not just Boston, like there's public trans transit issues all across the country. But it's kind of like, it's really disappointing. Like a 2023, we still don't have high-speed rail in this country. Europe has high-speed rail. Like we're so far behind in reference to infrastructure. And this is something I think we really need to, that's right, Sebastian. <laughs> trains that catch fire. Yes, our, our trains catch on fire. It's crazy with people inside of them. But this is something I think we really need to push and drive home is that the infrastructure here is so poor in this country. Even though Europe is older, than the United States, they have high speed rail. So what's the excuse for not having it here? We don't have anything in the United States that other countries have. We don't have health care. We don't have transportation. We don't have living wage. We have education system that bankrupts you. And it's because our co our country is completely 100% bought by corporations, right? So we're living in a fascist state. And the trick they play is the Democrats and the Democrat uh, liberal me corporate owned media, they try to trick you into thinking one party is fascist and one party isn't. So it keeps you inside that system thinking someone's actually fighting for you. There is nobody fighting for you inside the government of the United States. And that's what the just got revealed when the lefty uh, squad completely rolled over and became war pigs. So if you're a lefty, you're supposed to at least be against war. They're the biggest war pigs in the world, and they'll never stand up against the establishment to stick up for the people who got them there. So I know that's a long answer, yep. and I know it started with what's wrong with policing in America, but what's wrong with policing in America is a symptom of what's wrong with America. 
America is that we live in a 100% completely corrupt country where the gears of the government only work if it's lubricated with corruption, which is why we can send $100 billion at the snap of a finger to the most corrupt country in Europe while we won't send $100 billion to fix homelessness in America. That was a good way to put it that the reason why we have the problems that we have with policing is because the same reason why we have all these other problems with these other policies, issues in this country, and that is corruption. Corruption. We don't have health care for everybody because the pharma companies are corrupt, and that's where all the money goes, and the pharma companies, they donate to the politicians, so the politicians are not going to push for us to have some type of universal health care in this country. It's all corrupt, all of it. And so that's a big part of the problem. The police departments, again, they're corrupt. So it doesn't matter if you have one good police officer. Garland Nixon told you so himself earlier tonight. The entire system is corrupt. So if you don't change the system, it really doesn't make that much of a difference if you have a body cam. These systems need to be dismantled. You got to change the whole thing. The whole thing. Now, there is a way to do that. We'll see if we'll come back to Jimmy in just a minute. Well, let's go on for one more and then we'll bring it back. I want to show you something. Well, they do need a leader and that leader needs to have a hat, uh, Jimmy, but I'll not press you on that point uh, this time at least. The, uh, the characteristics of fascism are many, but of course, one of them is uh, that you have a rubber sta stamp parliament with one party in it. And that was proved all over again this week, wasn't it? The Republicans had run on uh, a, a ticket that criticized this huge largesse being given to the most corrupt country in Europe. But when it came to, when push came to shove, uh, they have now agreed to send the very same money. So we have absolute yeah. bipartisanship in, 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 in stuffing the mouths of the oligarchs in Ukraine, as long as they kick enough of it back to the United States through the military industrial complex and the politicians themselves. Am I right? Of you course, go. you're 100 percent right. And that's why people hate me from both parties in America. I get a lot of vitriol, especially from the Democrats, because I keep pointing out that the Democrats aren't different than the Republicans that on all the major issues, they serve the same people. Ralph Nader famously said the only difference between a Democrat and Republican is the speed at which their knee hits the ground when a donor walks in the room. And so the way we do politics in America is we only have two parties that are viable and they're both bought and paid for by the same people. So it's just, I don't know if you know, have you ever heard of the Harlem Globetrotters, but they're a, a basketball team in the United yeah. States and they play every game sure. against the Washington Generals and they always beat them and it's because they're being paid by the same guy it's a show and that's what's happening in the united states and when i tell people that the democrats aren't a lesser or two of evil they say i'm enabling fascists joe biden and the democrats are bigger fascists than trump ever even tried to be they again want to remind everybody that joe biden announced during the state of the union address last year he said we're going to fund the police more we're going to give them more money how is this any different? How is it any different from what we had before? Just crashed, they just crushed a railroad strike. So railroad workers don't get sick leave in the United States. Railroad workers, the glue that holds our economy together, they won't even give those people sick pay. That's how corrupted our whole culture and system is over here. And so they were gonna go on strike and they would have got it. They would have got it like that. Joe Biden and the Democrats, after just running an election saying you have to vote for us because we're the ones who are going to protect democracy and the Republicans are fascists, they immediately committed fascism and instituted a strike break. They broke that strike, passed the law that they had to accept the contract or it was illegal. So that's what the Democrats are. They're actually in bed with big business to crush workers. That's the definition of fascism. And you know what? I'm not a beat around the bush. Joe Biden and the Democrats are fascist. We live in a fascist country. 
country. And the idea that Joe Biden and the Democrats are fighting fasc fascism is a narrative the Democrat and the corporate media wants you to believe. They are fascists and the Democrats are not a lesser of two evil. They are a greater of two evils. They, uh, If Trump right now was saber rattling and trying to start a nuclear, starting wars with two nuclear powers, which is what Joe Biden's doing, people would be screaming bloody murder with their hair on fire. But because the corporate news media owned by the military industrial complex says it's okay and Joe Biden's supposed to not be crazy like Trump, then everybody, nobody can, they, they, they literally get people to go along with the Ukraine war as if Putin is some kind of a madman and we're not. We know we're occupying a third of Syria right now. And why are we occupying it? For the oil. Who said that? The president of the United States admitted that our foreign policy is based on stealing other countries' fossil fuels, which is what we're doing right now. And somehow in America, everybody just thinks Putin's bad and Ukraine's bad. They have no idea that America, the United States government and their military are the world's terrorists. Well said. Uh, one thing I do want to add here, uh, why do people, why are Americans, you know, most likely okay with that? Because Americans have been heavily propagandized and they believe they have been convinced mainly by mainstream media. Let's be real. They've been convinced that the other countries that we're stealing resources from are the bad guy. They're the enemy. I used to believe this stuff, man. I look back on it. I'm like, God, why did I fall for this? You know, I took civics when I was in high school. I know we had that civics discussion one time on here. I took civics when I was in high school. I believed all of this stuff. I really did. I used to believe like, well, yeah, we're doing, we're, we're, we're over there because, you know, they're bad people and we're the good guy in America. I used to believe those things. Heavily propagandized, heavily propagandized. Even when I take the time sometimes to explain to people, well, no, the U.S. government is stealing resources from that country. People just look at me like, well, they're the bad guy. Says who? Why do you believe they're the bad guy? Because Don Lemon told you so? Why? Why do we not do our own research and check up on these things ourselves? That's what I mean when I say people in America are heavily propagandized. Even if you go to other countries, a lot of they don't fall for this. They don't. Now, I mentioned to you, and I think this is important to highlight, I told you the Supreme Court, according to them, the police do not have an obligation to protect you. So if this is new to you, if you have not heard this before, I'm going to go right to this case right about here. Do, 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 do. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger because the font is a little bit... Um, there it is. Questions of police duty. The motto to protect and serve first coined by the LA police department in 1950s has been widely copied by police departments everywhere. But what exactly is a police officer's legal obligation to protect people? Must they risk their lives in dangerous situations like the one in Uvalde? The answer is no. In the 1981 case, Warren versus District of Columbia, the D.C. Court of Appeals held that police have a general public duty, but that no specific legal duty exists unless there is a special relationship between an officer and an individual such as a person in custody. Here's another example. The U.S. Supreme Court has also ruled that police have no specific obligation to protect. In its 1989 decision in DeShaney and Winnebago County Department of Social Services, the justices ruled that a social service department had no duty to protect a young boy from his abusive father. In 2005, Castle Rock versus Gonzalez, a woman sued the police for failing to protect her from her husband after he violated a restraining order and abducted and killed their three children. Justices said 
the police had no such duty. Share this with as many people as possible. So if the police don't have a duty to protect you, why are we giving them more money? Eric, can you put the link to this article in the chat just in case people want to share this with other people? That's a big one. That's a big one. They really don't have a duty to protect you. Pew. According to the Supreme Court, Angelique says, wow. I know the first time I saw this article, it was, I think it was last year when I saw this article, I was like, what? Go to some of the comments. JB says the police are purposefully useful for us, purposefully useful for the oppressor class. Soul says the police are there to keep the wealthy and property safe, not you. That's right. They protect capital. Loom says starts with learning the Pledge of Allegiance at five years old. I wonder if other countries' children are required to learn the country's pledge. That's a good question. That's a good question. Lee Ford, WTF, good are they? I don't know. I don't know. I'm telling you, share that article with as many people as possible. People need to know that according to the Supreme Court, the police do not have a duty to protect you. Sorry. I don't make up the rules. Now, what can you do about that? So Nick, who is a comrade of mine over at RBN, he's actually one of the co-founders for 10 Demands for Justice. This is the road to abolition. I'm not going to read all of it tonight. I'm looking at the time. I know we're a little pressed for time. So I'm not going to go through everything. But 10 Demands for Justice envisions a new society in which prisons and police are no longer necessary and communities are equipped to provide for their own health and safety. What are the demands? To set the stage for full abolition. Number one is to defund the police and reallocate resources to impacted communities. We all know about the defund. Two, demilitarize the police. That would mean we would not see them building a cop city right now in Atlanta, because that's actually what that is. More ways to militarize the police. Three, eliminate discriminatory policing, prosecution, and sentencing. Four, institute complete law enforcement, transparency, and accountability. That also means ending qualified immunity. Five, independently investigate all police crimes and abuses of power. Six, install community representation, oversight, and safety measures. Seven, end strategic counter protest violence. Eight, apologize and provide reparations. And if you click on each one, it'll tell you more detail. Nine, end the war on drugs. And 10, end carceral punishment. Thank you for sharing that, Eric. People say there's, they're like, what do they do? There's no demands. There's a whole list. There's a whole website that shows you the road to abolition. If you didn't know, now you know. <laughs> 